Hi there, I'm Nick Dearden with Confluent. Today we're going to talk about the tools and techniques available to us when we start thinking about writing applications that work with data in Kafka. Now, like any project, when you start out and you're thinking about tool selection, there are a bunch of criteria or axes along which you're thinking. So, for example, what skills do we have on the team? What skills would we like to acquire? How does this fit with our target architecture? What are the approved tools? Maybe we have an, like an approved vendor list or approved technologies list, and so on and so forth. And I want to draw your attention to one more of these dimensions along which we should be evaluating things. And it's maybe one that we don't always consider quite so explicitly. Probably we all do this unconsciously, but let's make it a little bit more conscious today. And we're going to talk about the trade-off between things which are, on the one hand, very flexible, and on the other hand, very simple. And let's imagine a spectrum of choices that looks like this. So what do I mean exactly by this? Well, over here on the flexible side, I often tell folks that you know when I started out, my first real job was writing IBM mainframe assembler code on a big green screen terminal, zeros and ones, poking hexadecimal digits into memory locations. Great fun. Uh, I'm glad those days are behind me. But you know what that means is that I can make that program do absolutely anything that the machine itself was physically capable of doing. And the price we would pay for that back in the day, when people were cheaper and hardware was more expensive, was that things would take a long time, and they were kind of buggy, it would take a lot of time to fix things up and tune them and QA them. Whereas over here, on the very simple end of my hypothetical spectrum, imagine you start your project, you go on Google or GitHub, you look around, and you find that someone has been before you with exactly the same problem, and they've built a toolkit or a DSL or something that you can download, and maybe you can get like a prototype or a proof of concept working this week with that thing. It could save you a lot of time. Now, of course, what you then find is if the person who originated or wrote that toolkit only had their problem was only maybe 80% the same as yours, then bending the tool to cover those last 20% can be really quite hard. It just wasn't designed to do that. It's very rigid in that it solves one problem or problem space very well and very elegantly. And that's the price that you pay for the simplicity is that you give up some of the flexibility. And so that's what we mean when we're talking about this spectrum. So how does that translate into the Kafka world? Well, down here at the assembly language end, we have the original Kafka clients. We often call these the producer and the consumer. The producer writes messages, consumer reads them, pretty obviously. And in the original Apache Kafka project, these were available on the JVM. Nowadays, of course, you can find this for .NET, or Go, or Python, or C and C++, and any one of a number of other languages. The API here is pretty much get message and put message. We use different verbs here. Uh, you send a message and you poll because you're listening for new messages, but it's the get and the put of the Kafka messaging world. So this is great because it's very flexible. You can do anything with these messages. But in the same way as my green screen code, uh, what it means is you have to deal with a lot of corner cases, especially in distributed systems, where maybe you're waiting for acknowledgments, they get overtaken on the WAN, or packets get dropped, you get a big callback chain of network errors and timeouts and things that you have to deal with. It can be quite complex. So there's a higher level of abstraction has been introduced that we can work with. That's what we call the Kafka Streams Library. I'm going to draw that in the middle of my spectrum here. Kafka Streams. And this is actually built from producers and consumers, plus a lot more code that surrounds them. So that's cool because it inherits all the things that this can do in terms of security configurations and tuning parameters and the like. Now here, this is a JVM technology. All right, so you can use it in Scala or Clojure or Java, whatever you like. And the API here is much more functional. All right, so there's a very functionally programming oriented DSL. So what does that look like? Well, it means you can map or flat map messages. You can aggregate or you can filter or even join streams of messages together. And just like in any functional programming language, the argument to each of these methods actually is your own business logic function. And the framework, the DSL library, is going to take care of applying your function to all the messages 
for a given topic or set of input topics. Now that's cool because it means not only does that framework handle for us all those weird network things, it means that some higher level constructs can be layered on top. So for example, if you look here, there are things like aggregate or join, which don't just operate on a single record at a time. You know, aggregate by its nature means to count or sum or what have you across a whole series of messages. Now that's really interesting because what that means is we introduce a concept that we're going to call partial state. So this is the difference between stateless and stateful processing of streams of data. Stateless is something like a map or a filter where I evaluate my logic against each record one at a time entirely independently of all the others. But as soon as I have something like aggregate, then what I'm doing is between one message and the next, I have to remember something. So imagine I'm the code here, I'm the processor. I'm trying to count up how many times something happens within five minutes. So after the first few messages have been by, I know that the count so far is maybe five. And I need to remember that so that when the next message comes, I can increment this and say, okay, the count is now six, and so on until I get to the end of five minutes, I reset that to zero and start counting again. Now, why is that important and interesting? Well, because we need to think about resilience. One of the key fundamental things in distributed systems is that everything will fail at some point. So what if your code, which is counting events per five minutes, fails in the middle of a five minute period? Well, it's great because all this is built out of consumers. Consumers have this consumer group mechanism. Kafka knows what offset you are at. So that when you bring up a replacement instance of your code, we will at least resume from the next input message from where you left off. That's great. But what we don't have is the count so far, this partial state information for where you are at. And so the Kafka Streams framework will take care of that for you. Whenever you do this kind of operation that requires partial state, it's going to write a change log on your behalf. That's a special Kafka topic that gets created under the hood. It's very like a database transaction log, actually. We're just recording that. The state for this operation is now four. Now it's five, now it's six. And when we need to restart for some reason, we replay that transaction log. It's just like a redo log in Oracle into the new instance. And then we start consuming input messages. Everything works out nicely. There are lots of cool value add things like that in this streams framework, make it very valuable. And now, as we progress further towards the simple end of the spectrum, the newest kid on the block here is KSQL, or KSQL if you prefer. This is built out of Kafka Streams inside of itself. So each of these things moving across here is just a higher level abstraction built on the preceding one. As you might guess from the name, KSQL API looks like SQL. So there's select from group by, where, having, and so on. That's exactly what the API looks like. And so what that means is there is a class of problems which can be easily expressed in SQL for which you can have this solution working this afternoon. But of course, not every solution, every problem can be expressed in SQL, right? It's no good for recursive or iterative algorithms, for example. So even though you can plug in your own custom functions in here, uh, you can't solve every problem with KSQL. And so in that case, you maybe want to fall back to thinking about, is Kafka Streams the right tool for the job? And then if that's not working for me, maybe I have to be down here at producer and consumer end. Now that's not to say that there's no place for producer and consumer, especially if you're in a situation where you maybe have an application today that's already working. And what you want it to do is simply to record events as it's doing things such that other services can listen to those events and respond to them asynchronously. That's particularly the case if you're embarking on a, let's break down my monolith into microservices kind of project, for example. So here, what you, all you need to do is just embed a producer inside your app to record that it's doing something occasionally. And you don't need anything more complex in that case. Where these other two solutions really shine is when you delve into the realm of what we call stream processing which means typically these are applications which listen to streams of events or messages. They do something, maybe side effects are generated, and usually there's also an output set of messages. Could be, I listen to a stream of payment authorizations, and I output a stream of potentially fraudulent ones and looks good ones that are okay. That's an easy example where 
that stream processing here, the orientation is around processing these events as they occur and doing something in response. So as we look across this spectrum, right, my guidance is, generally speaking, you always want to start looking from this side. Don't be afraid to decompose your problem into a sequence of steps, a la microservices, which can lead you to think, oh, I can do one or two steps, maybe here, very simply. Then there's a step that requires some more complex logic. Maybe I'll do that with Kafka Streams. The next stage of processing can be done with KSQL, and so on. And so that's how we think about using these tools when we're working with Kafka. So once again, my name has been Nick Dayton with Confluent. Thank you very much.